Well, it's great to, to be here this afternoon, and I do realize I am standing in between you and lunch, um, and the other presenter had so much humor um, and, of course, intellect and, and tact in his presentation. I wouldn't necessarily think or say that I have as much humor, and the fact that I'm standing between you and lunch, I will try to keep it as interactive and, and as brief as possible. Um, but like Lou said, my name is Injadeka Harry, and... I am the President and Chief Executive Officer of Youth for Technology Foundation. And Youth for Technology Foundation is an international nonprofit organization. We work at the intersection of appropriate technology in education and entrepreneurship. And our clients primarily are young people and women living in developing and or low-income communities. Uh, Youth for Technology Foundation was founded 19 years ago. Um, I founded the organization sitting in a cubicle at Microsoft in Redmond, Washington. Having moved to the United States from Nigeria in pursuit of a college education, big dreams I had as a little girl. And the greatest thing, the greatest aha moment, so to speak, for me in the college classroom was not social, it was not cultural, having moved from West Africa to the United States, but it was really technology, and technology as a tool for learning in the classroom. And I thought, you know, eight years, having graduated from college, started my career off first at General Electric, and then Microsoft in Redmond, Washington. I thought to myself, I grew up in a middle-class home, my parents were academicians, and I moved to the United States and I was lost in the classroom, primarily due to technology. How much so a young person growing up in a peri-urban or even a rural community in Africa? How can they possibly compete with 21st century opportunities? Indeed, they can't. And so while talent is relative, we know that opportunity isn't. And unless young people, especially those living in low-income and or developing communities, have an opportunity to match their talent with their potential, you know, the sky is not as, as limited as it may seem. And so that's really the premise of Youth for Technology <laughs> Foundation and, um, and how it was started. As we know, you know, Africa is, is known as the youngest continent. Um, you know, there are as many as 200 million young people between the ages of 15 and 24. And the International Labor Organization published some, some data a couple of years ago that indicated that as many as 40% of the jobs available on the continent do not go to people within the ages of 15 and 24. And so there is a lot of opportunity um, that where Africa and the young people here in Africa can actually be seen as a di digital dividend or really a, a digital di disaster. And so that's where technology really comes in in terms of playing a role in, in really revolutionizing the continent and taking it to the next level. But of course, education is a key factor, right? Many of us know that um, in many countries in Africa, our educational system is not just broken, it's actually obsolete. We're using curriculum from many, many years ago that's no longer relevant, especially in this age of the fourth industrial revolution and the future of work. And so our young people go through an educational system with a lot of theory, come out, and voila, they don't have any jobs. And the educational sector points to the private sector. Well, here is our very well-educated young person. Give them a job, and the private sector points back to the education community. Your young person is not adequately prepared. Your young person does not have the adequate skills. And so the young people are in the middle. They are, in essence, in the conundrum. And they are the ones that actually get to pay the price. So digital technologies, I'm sure, you know, we're on day one and a half of the conference. You've heard this term. Um, the prior speaker, as well as other speakers, have thrown around all the, all the fourth industrial revolution terms possible. But when you think of basic digital technology, um, it's 12 o'clock today. Assuming you got up at 7 a.m. I'm sure we've come in touch with several types of digital technology. Anyone? In your daily life? Okay. Okay, maybe you woke up and made coffee and 
When the coffee was ready, the coffee maker went off. Maybe by doing that, you mistakenly left the fridge door open and that, you know, a ringer went off in the fridge or what have you. And so there are many, many different types of digital technologies that, you know, are around today and, and play a part in this digital economy. So it's no longer about just basic digital literacy. It's no longer about just equipping our young people with, you know, this is a laptop or this is a computer and this is... Um, you know, how you can access the internet. Of course, access is important. Content, especially, um, especially local content, is, is equally important. But also, we have to teach our young people to learn. And really, what does that mean in this digital technology environment? It means that we need to be able to teach our young people to have a flexible learning model so that they can adapt in these technologies in the fourth industrial revolution, right? 65% of young people in primary school today are going to end up in jobs that don't exist yet. And that's data from the World Economic Forum. And so the ability for our young people to actually have that flexible learning model so that they can you know, adapt to the changing environment, not just the changing education environment, but the changing work environment is key. There's also data that shows that, you know, the growth in the digital job market is, is escalating. And by 2020, there will be about 1.5 million digital jobs available. Now, who will those jobs be available to? Of course, they'll be available to the young people, the youth that are most qualified for those jobs. And so how do countries in Africa um, stand up against countries in Europe, countries in Asia, countries in North America, and, and the rest of the world. And so it's really important that we are able to um, equip our young people with the skills so that they can transition um, to the world of work in this new digital economy, not just as enthusiastic employees, but actually as job creators themselves, um, and, and be able to you know, harness the potential in these economies as well. We're probably very familiar with this term, the educated unemployed. In Nigeria, which is a country Youth for Technology Foundation has worked in for 19 years, there's only one job for 35 graduating engineers that come out of universities, particularly because they, they don't actually have the right skills. And so our ability to be able to, you know, reskill them and retool them for this new economy is critical. Many of them have their certificates, even in, you know, in other African countries have their certificates, but they can't secure employment. Again, our work is, is at the um, intersection of education and entrepreneurship. You know, when I started this work 19 years ago, I remember, um, because we don't do this work alone. We do this work, of course, in partnership with government, the private sector, other civil society organizations. And I remember you know, speaking with private sector leaders. The year was 2001. And I remember talking about you know, this idea about bridging the digital canyon because young people in developing countries and young people in developed countries they just couldn't, I mean, young people in developing countries could not compete with their digital peers. And you know, I'd go on for five or 10 minutes talking to either a general manager or a managing director, even at technology companies in countries like Nigeria and Kenya. And after about five minutes, I'd get a blank stare. You know, I'd be like, did you hear me? Is, are, we, are we reaching a point here? And the feedback was often this. And the year was 2001. In Judeca, I've heard you. I know technology is important, but tell me again why you think there's a connection between young people and technology. It was 2001, that wasn't, that wasn't so long ago, right? A decade and a half ago, right? But it was kind of still a very foreign area. It was in the time when Microsoft was, you know, talking about getting a PC on every desk in every home. But young people were not really seen as co-creators of powerful technology solutions. The benefit that they had long productivity cycles was not necessarily something people really considered. And so when you had issues like health, when you had issues like obsol obsolete educational systems, a lot of people didn't really put together young people and technology. Well, fast forward you know, a decade and a half, everything is about 
young people and technology. Actually, I remember sitting with you yesterday at dinner and he asked me a question, you know, is, is this space competitive even for civil society organizations? And indeed it is because everyone's talking about technology and young people. Um, and so, you know, our, our goal is to, you know, differentiate ourselves as much as possible. When we started this work in 2001, it was basic digital literacy. We then evolved to you know, mobile and software application development, and in 2014, we began to introduce human-centered design and 3D printing into our curriculum, which I'll talk about a little bit later. One of my favorite um, you know, quotes is from a futurist, and many of you might be familiar with Alvin Toffler, but he redefines illiteracy in the 21st century. And he talks about illiteracy not being the ability just to read and write, but really one's ability or inability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Again, this is in the fourth industrial revolution, right? When we don't even really know what types of jobs are going to exist two years from now. Um, the World Economic Forum, again, in, in, in one of their jobs reports, um, you know, dictated that 60% of the jobs that exist by 2020, that's in a year, is that right? Oh, a couple of months, <laughs> not even a year. 60% uh, of those jobs that exist, only about 40% of people today have the skills um, that are going to fill those jobs. So it's, it's a little bit of a scary time, but again, there's ample opportunity as well. Um, all these pictures in this deck, by the way, are um, pictures from our work at Youth for Technology Foundation. We established 3D printing clubs in secondary schools in Nigeria. This is one of the clubs. Um, we use you know, different types of hardware, 3D printers, different types of software. The idea is to create a generation of young people that understand that they can invent, create, and design the world that they envision for themselves. And that's what we're doing with 3D printing technology. Let's talk about disruptive technologies for a minute. There are four primary things um, that make technologies disruptive, so to speak. And in a lot of the, in, in a lot of the uh, types of technologies we've heard about in the fourth industrial revolution, we know that they are accelerating, right? They're moving at a very, very fast pace, right? 3D printing, for instance, uh, you know, it was estimated in terms of the revenue in 2013, the revenue was estimated at $3 billion. Well, in 2025, the revenue is estimated as somewhere around 30 billion with, um, with about $500 billion worth of sales coming from 3D printing revenue. So it's accelerating very, very quickly. In terms of broad applicability, also it is um, one other factor um, into transformative and disruptive technologies. So these types of technologies are impacting large groups of people and large industries. You know, not just manufacturing, it's agriculture, it's education, um, it's transportation. So across large, very, very large industries. Um, there's a large economic impact in terms of dollars, euros, or what have you, and, and it creates just an enormous amount of value um, across the board, across different knowledge workers. And then also, the former speaker mentioned um, this with Amazon's work, and this holds true um, really for all disruptive technologies, is that they're able to move the surplus from, fr from the uh, producers to the consumers, okay? So... I'm, I'm really passionate about 3D printing, so you hear me mention that a lot, but think about Nike and their manufacturing facility in Portland, Oregon. Um, you know, we wear Nike shoes in Africa. Well, why can't there be a 3D printing, maybe sole manufacturer um, somewhere in South Africa, somewhere in Kenya, somewhere in Rwanda, or what have you, so that we're bringing the manufacturing closer to the continent, to the consumer, and you know the 3D printing facility can be can be run by a young person who has computer aided design skills and knows how to use a 3D printer. And so you can think about how close you can bring that manufacturing, um, you know, to where the consumers really are. The history of disruptive technologies. This has been touched on also quite a bit, um, where we have seen, of course. With Moore's law, the prices of these technologies are going down. But we also know that these technologies um, impact the gross domestic product as well. And in 
an age where there's emerging and disruptive technologies, such as one that we're in right now, we see that the gross domestic product is actually increasing in, in a lot of these countries. Just some price comparison, you know, a supercomputer in 1975 and an iPhone 4 of equal value, 1975, what the price was, $5 million, of, of, um, $5 million versus $400 today. Um, so the technology is getting faster, but it's also becoming cheaper as well. Um, we all know Africa is a mobile first continent. Um, you know, I was reading some, some information actually a couple of days ago about the dollar amount of processing that happens with mobile payments every single day, $1 billion every single day. That's huge. Um, Africa, of course, has been able to leapfrog a lot of its infrastructural issues because of, of uh, you know, our mobile technology and what we've been able to do there. Um, in the first year of running Hack for Good, um, we had six private sector partners, and in year two, which was just completed, we had about 18 private sector partners. So the private sector sees the need for this, right? If they're looking for good talent, if they're looking for skilled workers, they want to ensure that those workers have those skills and are looking towards, you know, the fourth industrial revolution um, to help those businesses. Just so some quick examples of, of disruptive technologies, which we've seen reflected throughout the conference. And then in the video that I just showed, of course, is, is mobile internet is one of them. And then really the automation of knowledge work, right? Intellig uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera. Um, in terms of the value, an estimated five to seven trillion of economic impact by 2025. And you're remembering those, you know, that bucket list of four items, one of those items in terms of really identifying disruptive technologies was the economic impact. Um, of course, advanced robotics. This is actually a prototype that was developed um, about a year and a half ago. Um, in Hack for Good 2017, it's a robotic arm that uh, is currently being piloted in one of the bakeries in, in Nigeria. It was created by one of the teams. Um, they met at Hack for Good, developed the pro prototype at Hack for Good, um, have since secured um, a little bit of startup funding for the product, and it's being used in one of the bakeries in Nigeria. But we know also, um, you know, in, in terms of disruptive technologies, robotics, and um, and, and robots are in that space as well. This was also um, a prototype uh, from, from Hack for Good also. Energy storage, one of the disruptive technologies, and this particular prototype uses advanced battery storage systems that can help with solar and wind power as well. So really the ability to take local issues and create technology products that address local issues. This is not just you know, a pie in the sky, any issue. These are concrete realities that our young people are facing every single day on the continent. And of course, 3D printing that I'm a huge fan of. Um, you know, we have uh, two engineering prototype hubs in universities in Nigeria looking to establish five by the year 2022. Um, we really believe that, again, universities are, are research grounds um, for this to happen, as well as grounds for, for talent to be built up. The 3D printing market has been growing, the cost of the equipment has been coming down. In this gig economy, we know that young people can have four or five fractions of different types of jobs. You can be an Airbnb host, you can be an Uber driver, even a Lyft driver, or what have you. The idea is that this technology is really democratizing the space. Um, in 3D printing, you know, our young people are not just learning how to print, but they're learning how to access online marketplaces to actually market and sell their 3D printed products. And so it's really an entire kind of business cycle that they're benefiting from as well. So having said that, then what, or so what? Um, something has to change, or a couple of things have to change, especially uh, as it relates to education, infrastructure, of course, and policy. And so in the education space, our curriculum is, is outdated. The work that civil society organizations do, like Youth for Technology and many others, is useful, but is perhaps not enough. And we need more players in the space, and we need an enabling environment. So we need government intervention, we need private sector intervention. We need private sector in the classroom because we can't develop curriculum for the jobs of the future if private sector isn't in the classroom, because the private sector knows what they want their business to look like and their products to look like. And so it's really a hands-on um, effort 
you know, for, for the private sector to be in the classroom as well. And then formulating policies on, on the digital economy that will help create an environment uh, where young people's ideas can grow, where young people feel like they can share the ideas publicly and those ideas won't be, <laughs> won't be created by 10 other people the next day. Um, and, and, you know, we also need policies that don't stifle innovation and creativity in this process, this ideation process of young people. And then finally, of course, digital infrastructure still remains a, a barrier. Um, access to electricity in, in many countries still, still in Africa and digital devices. Um, we fundamentally believe that access to technology should be a basic human right. It should be affordable and accessible to virtually every single person on the planet. And we hold, we hold very strongly to that. And then, you know, take, take uh, lessons from, you know, the broadband satellite launched in February in Rwanda um, that's giving access to a lot of their young people and their, a lot of their businesses in the startup space as well. Rwanda, of course, is an example, a good example of an African country really leading in the ICT space.